So some of you are probably wondering, okay, so I want to hand sew, but how do I start? Where do I begin? Uh, you can get fancy with hand sewing equipment. You can get really simple with it. And regardless of if you get high quality or low quality materials, um, there's not a lot of them and it's very easy to transport. So if you are used to knitting or crocheting or doing embroidery, you're used to being able to take your handwork with you. And that's the amazing thing about hand sewing is that you can pick it up and take it anywhere. You can do it on the couch while you're hanging out with your family. You can stitch up a seam as you're going to work. People are always amazed and excited to see somebody working with their hands in public. If you're again like a knitter, you probably understand that sensation. Same exact thing with hand sewing. We are going to do a basic hand sewing sampler. We're gonna go over how to do a running stitch a back stitch and how to hem. Those three stitches will create a fantastic foundation for you so that you can remember what your hands can do. All right, let's get started. So to start, I want you to cut out a piece of fabric that is 30 centimeters by 15 centimeters or 12 inches by six inches. This piece of fabric is going to be just like a really nice size um, just to do a basic hem, basic basting, basic back stitch. So we're just going to do some basic stitching today with this simple piece of fabric. And then other tools that I would recommend um, would be things like obviously thread. This is linen thread. This is a 60 two by 2 weight, which is good for... Um, hand sewing 80 by 2 is slightly finer so it depends on the type of fabric you're working with the weight of your linen thread I strongly encourage people to use natural fibers linen thread um, as well as cotton or silk silk is very strong um, cotton is not as strong but if you're using a linen thread you also want your wax to wax it with obviously a trusty little pin cushion to keep your your pins and your needles in um, small pair of scissors for this particular activity and then my favorite thing, a thimble. I'm using a metal, metal thimble that I use at Colonial Williamsburg, and that's also where I purchased it. Um, for metal thimbles, it's a little bit tricky. You wanna make sure that you find one that is not too tight, but not too loose. So as I shake my hand, you'll notice that it doesn't come off, but it also isn't cutting off my circulation. Um, it also doesn't go down to the bottom of my first knuckle. It's kind of in between um, my cuticle bed and the and my first knuckle. So definitely my favorite, one of my favorite objects that I own and really helpful for hand sewing. If thimbles are kind of tricky for you, what I would recommend doing is wear it around the house for about a week and eventually it'll feel like it's part of your own skin. And when you take it off, it'll feel like you're kind of naked. So I'm definitely a huge fan of the metal thimble. If you can't get one from Colony Williamsburg, getting uh, an antique one if you go to a flea market or a sale that's also a really good place to look for them um, there's also a great company in france that has beautiful beautiful thimbles and you can also buy brass thimbles as well um, this one is silver so definitely a favorite so to go ahead and draw one line kind of from the top edge this is about two inches from the top edge or about five centimeters from the top edge, and then another one about two inches or five centimeters from there. So we're gonna do a running stitch here, we're gonna do a back stitch here, and then we're gonna hem the bottom. Let's get started. To begin, I'm going to spool off a amount of thread that is about as long as my arm. When it comes to beginning sewing, people often wonder, well, how long should I cut my thread? And it's about as long as your arm. If you're using linen, you're then going to coat this with wax. And when I coat my linen thread, I actually will pinch the linen on my wax and then just pull it through with my non-dominant hand. The wax is going towards me and the thread is going away from me. And I'm gonna do that about three, four times, maybe even five times, just to coat it because the linen itself is kind of fuzzy. So we wanna make sure that it gets coated so that it has um, a nice nice uh, coating of wax. So therefore when it goes through the fabric, it's not going to fray. It doesn't inherently make it stronger, it just makes it 
but easier and better to work with. And then I'm gonna needle my thread. And then when I knot it, I'm gonna take my tail, put it through my thumb, between my pinch it between my uh, needle and forefinger, wrap it around a couple times, pinch it, and then pull that together. So if you're looking for how to thread a needle, how to knot your thread, I have a video that is called Can't Thread a Needle, watch this. Um, and so that will help you with that very simple technique. The easiest stitch to start with is a running stitch. The running stitch is a stitch that can be used for quilting, it can be used for basting, it can be used for seaming, all dependent upon how big or small it is. But we're gonna start out just using the size of a running stitch that's perfect for basting. So to begin, all I'm gonna do is hold my needle with my thumb and forefinger, and then rest the back of this needle with my middle finger of my dominant hand. And I'm going to just dip the tip of the needle into the fabric, and then with my non-dominant hand, I'm going to kind of push that fabric down. And as I do that, I can gently kind of push the needle upward so it comes out of the fabric. I'm gonna push it with these three fingers. And the final push will come from the side of my middle finger. I'm gonna pinch it with my thumb and forefinger as I pull it out of the fabric. And then I'm gonna catch it with my pinky as I'm stitching. So once again, dipping it down, pushing it back out. And for a running stitch, or for a basting stitch, these stitches can be pretty big. It depends on what kind of sewing you're doing. Sometimes for basting, you only want them to be um, maybe a quarter of an inch long, or say like four millimeters long. But sometimes you want them to be, say like, two centimeters long or almost an inch long, depending on, again, the type of basting you're working on. And if you're seaming, you want those to be like maybe a millimeter or two millimeters long. And in this case, maybe like a 16th or an eighth of an inch wide if you're doing some seaming. So it all just depends on what your goals are. So what I would encourage you to do if you're a beginner is to just go ahead and stitch down the length of this and just get used to feeling the fabric, get used to the dexterity of holding it, and pay attention to your technique. And as you get better at it, then you can kind of play around with size and consistency. The trick to consistency is just making sure you match each stitch, and you're putting the, fat, the needle through the fabric in the same distance in the same dimension. So as I'm sewing, you can see how I can do different sizes. And then when I'm finished, I wanna go back to the stitch I just did. And then that creates a, a nice little back stitch. I'm gonna clip that and there you have it. A nice running stitch sampler just to practice your technique. Now for a very strong stitch. People often wonder, well wait, isn't hand sewing not as strong as actual machine sewing? And it's actually stronger, especially if you use a back stitch like this. To, so to begin, we're going to take a look at the line beneath the one that we just stitched on, and this is gonna be the line where we begin. When you stitch a back stitch, you're actually going to begin a stitch width away from the edge because you're actually gonna be looping back to the end of the material or to the beginning of the line in this case. So what I'm gonna do is if I'm, if I'm right-handed, I'm gonna be stitching actually right to left, but I will be looping, I will be putting, going back to my right. And if I'm left-handed, I'm gonna be stitching right, or excuse me, left to right. And I'll be looping back on myself going, going to the left. So to begin here, I'm right-handed. So I'm going to do a little stitch width from the end here. and pull that up and then the knot's gonna lock it in place. Now I'm gonna put my needle to the right of where the tail is at the end of the line and then I'm gonna jump forward and I'm going to make sure that the, where the needle comes into the fabric is the same distance from the tail 
as the tail is from where the needle goes out of the fabric. So that's a little trick to make sure that your stitches are going to be nice and even. Now, the, it's hard sometimes to create good tension when you're working with a single layer of fabric on a back stitch. I've noticed. And so if you're, if you're a beginner to this, I just want to encourage you that part of it is the fact that it's hard to do this on one single layer. Um, but you wanna make sure that the stitch is laying flat on the top of the fabric and isn't too kind of loose. See how that's kind of loose? We don't want that, but we also don't wanna to pull too tight that it puckers up the material. So it's a little bit of a dance when it comes to this. So now I'm just gonna go back to the stitch I just made. You might go through the hole of the last stitch or you might just get very, very close to it. And then again, go to the left or if you're left-handed to the right. So I'm going back to the stitch I just made, jumping over underneath the material And as you're working, I want you to try and keep the work parallel to you as much as possible because we don't want to be moving our wrists. We don't want to be doing one of these. So we don't want to be stitching like this because that's going to hurt our wrists. And we want to make sure that this isn't painful for us. So keeping that work as parallel to you as possible, keeping this needle as parallel to you as possible, and making sure when you're pushing that needle through the fabric, you're actually going to be using your whole arm to push it and then pull it out. So you can see here how that's kind of loose and that's because of the nature of just doing a back stitch through one row of fabric. It can be very hard to make it lay down. So when you have two rows of fabric, it will work fine. So once you're done kind of practicing your stitch, your back stitch here, what I would encourage you to do is actually put two pieces of fabric together, draw a line, and then try, try it again. All right, continue to stitch your back stitch along that whole line so you get a lot of practice. This particular stitch that touches one another is actually what the sewing machine is based off of. And so if you ever see hand sewing that looks perfect, it's just because it's a well-practiced back stitch. So just keep practicing in order to, to create a stitch that people are going to think is done by a machine. But remember that the hands came first and the machine was created after the hands were able to perfect it. Also, as you enter into your hand sewing journey, I have seen people think that they need to stitch a back stitch everywhere on a garment because they're trying to mimic a machine. That's actually not the case. A back stitch is often only used for underarm construction and for seams that have a lot of stress. Okay, now it's time to put your running stitch into action because we're going to hem the bottom edge of this fabric. In order to hem, we need to fold up the fabric once, baste it into place, and then fold it up a second time and do a hem stitch in place. So first we're gonna baste it. And for this hem, I'm going to turn it up about, um, I don't know, maybe about four millimeters, roughly or so, and then maybe about a quarter of an inch, and just baste it all the way across. And this can be ugly basting. The great thing is that your left hand is actually gonna be working with you. So it's gonna be put, it's actually gonna fold it ahead of your dominant hand doing the stitching. So you're gonna fold it, you're gonna do basting stitch, and then you're gonna fold it, and you're gonna do a basting stitch, and you're gonna fold it, and you're gonna do a basting stitch. So this is just gonna be nice and big temporary stitches to hold this in place. Because when you baste it up, what's gonna happen is that's going to create a nice smooth edge to then turn up a second time so you can hem it and the raw edge will be completely encased. This is also a good technique just to know how to do um, because it's actually the foundation of how to put linings in place, um, which I'm sure I will make a video about at some point. So there you go, baste it up. Very quick, really easy, nothing, nothing complicated.
So now for a hem stitch. Essentially, whatever you basted this up, it will easily turn up that same distance again. So you can do a, a nice fine hem that way, or if you're doing a thicker hem, you might decide to baste it up just a smidge and then turn this up in a much more deep way and then do a hem stitch up there. Depends on the project. For historic sewing, you typically see very small turnings as they're referred to. They're not called seam allowance, they're called turnings. So this one is going to be relatively small. So once again, we're gonna turn it up a second time and now we're gonna hem it in place. To do a, to do a hem stitch, I like to start putting my needle perpendicular to the fold right here. So we're gonna push the needle perpendicular to the fold, only a couple of yarns down from the fold. And when I say yarns, I mean the actual yarn that's woven in the fabric. So you can see that stitch is only very, is very, very close to that edge, to that fold. So I'm gonna hold that, I'm gonna push that through, and that's gonna lock that knot in place. So now let's hold it down and let's do a hem stitch. I'm gonna do a couple and then I'm gonna explain what I'm doing. So just watch me a second as I put the needle down. So this is what the hem stitch looks like. It goes all the way through the underside here. So it creates a little top stitch and it is visible. So this is not like a slip stitch or a blind hem. If it was a blind hem, we'd actually put the needle through the fold itself in order to, through the fold itself like this, to actually hide it. And we're not doing that. What I'm doing to create these tiny little angled stitches is you can see where the tail of the thread is here. When I put my needle down into the fabric that we're actually attaching the fold to, I'm going just a smidge to the left where I put my needle in. So if I were to draw a straight line, say with my thread here, I'm not putting my needle in up here. I'm actually putting it in a little bit to the left and slightly under the beneath the fold. So I'm going down and then at the same motion, I'm gently pushing that needle through the fold about a, a thread or maybe two away from the fold. And so what that's going to create is a stitch that has a slight angle and a stitch that is very small. A lot of beginners have the mistake of wanting to kind of like over stitch this. They want, they're afraid that they're not going to get it. So what they'll do is they'll grab like a lot of the material and they'll kind of hork it around. And then that creates a really big, ugly stitch. All you're doing is gently kind of dipping down into the material, going through the fold and pulling that through. And once you kind of get that motion, then you can create a nice even stitch. I love this because a hem is so versatile. You can hem material, you can do applique with this stitch, you can fell seams with this stitch, um, you can mend with this stitch. Once you kind of get the hemming stitch down, you've got a lot, kind of the world kind of opens up to you. Um, some people call it a hem stitch, some people call it a whip stitch, some call it a fell stitch, some call it uh, an applique stitch. And honestly, um, I'm fine with whatever you want to call this. A lot of the times what I'll do is um, I'll call it a hem stitch if I'm hemming, and then if I'm doing a, if I'm felling, then I will call it a felling stitch. So sometimes to me it has to do with the, ap the application, um, and if I was doing applique, then I probably would call it an applique stitch but a lot of it has to do with just the technique. So that's that's your hem stitch. So go ahead and just do the rest of it. Oops, do the rest of it here. Just like, I mean, I stopped here with the back stitch, but I would encourage you also to do back stitch all the way to the end, just so that you get a bunch of practice. As you're hemming, remember to keep your needle parallel with the work. It's easy to try and cant it perpendicular to the work, but if you can keep it as parallel as possible, it's gonna help you to create a nice fluid motion like you see me doing here in the video. The hem stitch is incredibly versatile. It may be one of my favorite stitches because not only can the hem stitch be used to finish off the bottom of say, your pants or a skirt or a top, this same stitch is used 
in felling seams, setting in linings, and it's also used for what's known as a mantua maker seam. So once you can master the hem, you can essentially create hems, put linings in, and do a variety of different types of seams. These are going to be useful whether or not you do historical work or whether or not you do modern work. And as I'm working, something else that you might notice is that I am really using my left and my right hand together. I haven't sped up this video. This is as fast as I'm stitching. So with practice, you can get very speedy with your hands. And the needle itself is not actually moving in a very dramatic way. It's more or less just dipping down into this fabric and then I'm pulling it back up again in essentially just a very rhythmic motion. So congratulations, you finished all of your hemming. That's amazing. And now you're wondering what the heck do I do here at the end? Well, you need to knot it off. And to knot that off, what I do is take a little bit of a stitch, not through the fold, just through that the piece of fabric that you're hemming to. I will make a loop and then I will go through that loop either once or twice. If I'm using linen thread, I typically just do once. And then to hide that knot, I will take my needle and I will go in between the fabric and the fold and I'll come towards myself and I'll pull that nice and snug and look, it looks like just another stitch. It's nice and hidden. And then I will trim this off and there it is. You've done all of that hemming. Now you can take out your basting stitches and be pr proud of what you've accomplished. Hey, congratulations on stitching your stitch sampler. This might be the first time you ever threaded a needle and tried to hand sew. If so, like amazing. I am so excited for you. If you have been doing a lot of machine sewing, um, maybe with a little bit of hand sewing, but you're trying to up your game, that's amazing. I'm so excited that you're going on a hand sewing journey. Regardless of why you're here, for historical reasons, for modern reasons, Hand sewing brings us together and it really does seam the world together because I bet everybody knows somebody who knows how to work with their hands. Um, and it's important that we continue on this practice and we preserve it um, because it's important that we reconnect ourselves. It's important that we connect ourselves. Through hand sewing, we can reconnect to ourselves we can reconnect to our past through reproducing the skills of the past. It allows us to be more present because it can be almost like a meditation or a prayer. It can be very therapeutic. And as we can go through that process to learn more about our past, to be a more present human, that allows us to stitch a better future. So thank you so much for being with me on this hand sewing journey. I hope that you will also remember what your hands can do.